Hey everybody, hope you're doing well. It was another packed week of Champions League football. Not all of it great, to be honest with you. I think the players all look a little bit tired after the season and the last, with you know, the late ending and everything. But anyway, let's talk about it. Thanks for joining me. Of course, if you knew them, be sure to subscribe and join our growing community on our way to 200,000 subscribers. That's insane to think of. In the least surprising result of the week, Manchester City took on floundering FC, aka Borussia Mönchengladbach, and headed them their seventh consecutive loss. Outrageous how far they have fallen, man, and really sad to see. Guardiola fielded an extremely strong 11 for City, about as strong as you can get, for the most part. And while the fate of this one was all but sealed in the last match with the two away goals from City, they got it done early doors in the second leg to really put the tie beyond the struggling Germans. I mean, right off the rip, basically, just a few minutes in, Manchester City were causing all sorts of problems, namely Juan Cancelo, and his incredible delivery was taken down early by Phil Foden, and the young Englishman just couldn't get his finishing down, took the ball down well, couldn't get his finishing down well. Mbolo did have a decent strike toward goal that deflected, fortunately, but Ederson, with the form he's been in this season, he got a hand to the deflected strike to keep it at nil-nil, and set the stage for some magic from Kevin De Bruyne. After Mahrez and Rodri worked the ball on the right flank, Mahrez rolled it inside to De Bruyne and on his left peg, he smashed it in off of the bar. It was filthy, but a delight to watch over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And once again, for good measure. And just a few minutes later, as stated earlier, they well and truly killed it off with Phil Foden, the phenom, driving forward and threading a diagonal ball between Elvedi and Ginter to who else but the free-scoring Gundogan, who made no mistake with the finish, rolling it past a stranded Jan Sommer. Mbolo had another opportunity, but he's not a very good finisher, and he showed it once again. That really has been the biggest issue for this Gladbach side, with their suddenly horrendous in front of goal, and it's really rearing its ugly head in a fierce way these days. So City take it, they move through 4-0 on aggregate, no real surprises there. On to the next one. Ah yes, a tie that had disappointed me in a massive way. And before you say it, no, not because Atalanta is out. Sure, I like seeing smaller, not even in quotations, smaller clubs do well in the competition given their history and how they are overachieving with the means that they have. But I was more disappointed at just how low this tie was in entertainment. I had hoped for a goal fest, but I should have known better as that hasn't really happened in any of these matches. Besides, of course, Dortmund versus Sevilla. Shout out to Dortmund and Sevilla. Those were really, really entertaining matches. Coming into this tie, it had the potential to be something like the Dortmund versus Sevilla tie, but Atalanta never showed up. In the first match, you could blame them playing with 10 men for the 75 minutes. In the second leg, blame Zidane, or praise him, I should say, because he changed his formation and it made all the difference in stopping Atalanta's attack dead in their tracks. This past weekend, Zidane made the switch to a three at the back, 3-1-4-2, and against Atalanta, he tweaked it slightly to a 3-5-2 formation, something that we saw, you know, Tuchel do to turn Chelsea's defense around. And it's done the same for Real Madrid, with the three at the back, plus the wing backs, Plus Cruz and Valverde dropping, there's almost nowhere for their opponents to go. They're extremely difficult to break through. And you know what? I think we'll see plenty more teams across Europe use this formation. Maybe Zidane saw how it worked for Chelsea. Maybe he saw how it worked for Inter against Atalanta. Who knows? But I think we'll see more teams across Europe go back to this and play less of an open game. Anyway, Karim Benzema was at it again in this one, and he really should have had two goals. But his first was an absolute gift from Atalanta keeper Sportiello. I mean, his attempt at clearance went straight to Luka Modric. Modric squares to Benzema and boom, 1-0. In the second half, Real Madrid got a penalty, which was confusing at first as it looked like the foul came outside of the box from Toloi on Vinicius, but upon reviewing it, we could see that Toloi's left foot doesn't actually touch Vinicius and it's his right foot, which was right on the line of the 18, that clips Vinicius, clear pen in that case. Well, not clear, I guess, because it took many, many replays. <laughs> but the right call, I should say. Sergio Ramos from the spot, 2-0, dead and buried. Asensio scored one much later to Sandra Shamuriel free kick, and Real Madrid go through. Oh, and Vinicius had a great run that ended with another failed finish. Everything but the final ball or the finish from him is great. An extremely controlled, competent performance from Real Madrid, and like I said, I wonder if Zidane will continue to employ this shape with three at the back, or if he just utilized it to stop an Atalanta surge and use it on the weekend to test it out before playing against Atalanta. We'll see. 
Bayern Munich had dusted Lazio in the first leg 4-1 away, and so this one felt like a bit of a formality. Though Lazio did perform better in this match, and they did put up more of a fight, I guess, than in the first leg, sort of. I don't know. They defended better, and they eradicated some of the horrendous defensive errors, at least in comparison to the last match. Oh! Penalty given away after 30 minutes. And Lewandowski with the goal from the spot, as is so often the case when he's evolved with penalties. He nearly had a second later in the match, actually, when he struck from outside of the box against the post for Reyna to collect. But the super sub, Eric Maxim Chupamoting, got a goal just under two minutes after he had replaced Robert Lewandowski. Stunning ball from Alaba. Parolo did pull him back for Lazio, but I mean, they barely did anything in the attack. Bayern, the deserving winners. Not much to say about this one, guys. Lazio pushed hard in the final 10 minutes or so, but for most of the match, Bayern were calm and in control, and they advance as one of the favorites for this tournament, still with a massive 6-2 win on aggregate. Okay, Chelsea versus Atletico Madrid from Stamford Bridge, and this was another extremely disappointing display from Diego Simeone's Atletico side. They have absolutely fallen off after they had such an incredible start to the season, and he's reverted to his comfortable shell once again by playing his standard 4-4-2 style formation from the rip, despite the 3-4-2-1 serving them so well earlier in the season. And then when it was too late and they were stretched, he switched that formation and they started giving Chelsea tons of chances in transition because they were pushing for a goal themselves. But hey, before we get to that, what happened in this game? Well, first of all, Chelsea went with their very familiar formation under Tuchel and what is becoming their best combination in the attack with Havertz as the false nine, Werner and Ziyech on either side of him, constantly rotating and moving around, swapping positions, getting in behind, staying fluid and causing problems for Atletico's defense. Which speaking of Atletico's defense, Savic and Jimenez got the start over Mario Hermoso, a guy who has been incredible for them this season. They did have Trippier back, which is big, playing in a back four, but Renan Lodi down the left, I mean, he doesn't do it for me at all. And speaking of that Atletico defense, Chelsea found themselves in behind it after 34 minutes when their front three combined, Havertz playing through Werner, and Werner played the ball across the box for Ziyech to smack past Oblak. Definitely the kind of strike that you'd expect a shot stopper of Oblak's caliber to stop. But these things happen. Weaker goals happen to everyone. Doesn't change that he's an incredible shot stopper still. Chelsea did score late, which we'll talk about, but let's touch on a few things. First of all, seeing an Atletico side that was so fun to watch changed back to the, you know, old Simeone, 4-4-2, I want to claw my eyes out in boredom. It's a shame. I mean, they offered very little going forward, which is also a massive credit to Chelsea. Don't get me wrong. When called upon, Edouard Mendy was lights out. When called upon, Antonio Rudiger was a giant, daddying up on everyone out there, taking no shit from anybody, using his physicality perfectly, as Piliqueta played a typically clean game for the most part, and Kurt Zuma was tidy as hell. Credit to the defense also has to go to their central midfielders, namely N'Golo Kante, who was constantly breaking things up in the middle and launching attacks in the other direction. Where was Luis Suarez this game? Didn't see him. Pocketed. Now, there was an untidy moment from Espilicueta that had some screaming for a penalty for Atletico Madrid, which wasn't given, and here's where I stand on it. Crasco gets beyond Espilicueta, Espilicueta sort of drags his fingers across Crasco's belly, and Crasco hurls himself to the floor. So first things first, that was a very silly move from Espilicueta. Just in doing that, raking your fingers across a player no matter how gently, you're forcing a decision out of the referee. And once you do that, it's a coin flip at that point. However. I really hope that we are moving away from the contact in the box equals penalty sort of mentality that referees now have when it comes to the implementation of VAR and that we have. We've all been guilty of it. We see any sort of touch in the box and we're screaming penalty. I've been guilty of it too, guys. Of course. And what makes it confusing is the subjectivity or the interpretation of the different referees. And on this occasion, this particular referee didn't give a penalty. And I like that. I feel like with VAR, we have been conditioned even more so to think that if there is a touch on the shoulder or the chest, even though we all know that a fit, strong person who is determined to get to the ball wouldn't be brought down by that touch on the shoulder or the stomach or what have you, we scream for a penalty because that's what we've been conditioned to do. 
In doing that, players will dive and go down even more and they'll continue to push that boundary. And so the line is blurred now. Do we punish the players for every touch they ever have on the opponent? Do we punish the defenders, I mean? Is it now automatically a foul to put your arms on the opponent, even if you don't pull them back, even if your arm's just there? Are we going to reward the players that collapse on the floor or punish them for diving? I mean, the direction we have head in certainly seems like rewarding those who go down with the slightest of touches. But it would be nice to see us start punishing those who dive and try to con the referee instead of those who brush their arm across the belly of an opponent. What's even more frustrating, had Carrasco stayed on his feet with Mendy flying out as his mercy, I mean, it really does look like he would have beat him to the ball and he could have rounded him and potentially won a penalty or scored. I mean, instead, we're here talking about how much contact is enough for a penalty and the requirement seems to be getting less and less. So where are we headed with this? I mean, Salah comes to mind. I'm sorry, this is who we spoke of in the live stream. <laughs> and he gets rewarded for this stuff all the time, among other players. Let me be clear, I'm not saying he's the only one that does it. But why wouldn't they? these players do this? If referees are giving in to their theatrics from a tiny touch, then power to them, I guess. Keep on doing it until they stop giving them away. I don't like it in the slightest but I understand why they do it. Now in the name of balance, I can also recognize that this begs the question of how much contact is enough and what is the measure of contact. And look, ultimately some referees are going to call that as a penalty, some aren't. That's never going to go away. Some I will agree with and some I won't. Some you'll agree with, some you won't, and that's fine. Anyway, speaking of theatrics, let's talk about the red card. So a corner kick and the referee comes over and warns Savage and Rudiger as they were grappling and roughhousing <laughs> at the corner kick. He stops the kick before it's taken, gives them a warning to cut it out and tells them that he's watching them. The corner is taken and from it, Savage gets a red card. Why? Because he winds up and elbows Rudiger in the chest. I mean, this is violent conduct. This is a red card. It doesn't matter where you elbow someone. You just simply cannot deliberately elbow your opponent. It's constituted as violent conduct and a red card is the only outcome here. This is a masterclass in boneheadedness from Savage, really. You were just warned. The referee just warned you that he's watching you and you elbow your opponent blatantly. Didn't even make it look like an accident right in front of the referee. I mean, do worse things happen off the ball that don't get noticed? For sure. But this one had a spotlight on it because the referee was staring right at them and he had no choice but to give it. Anyway, enough of that stuff. Emerson came on for what was his first appearance under Tuchel in over a month. And with what was his first touch of the ball, he absolutely smashed it low past Jan Oblak. Thiago Silva, Mount, and Jorginho lose it in the stands. Chelsea threw to the quarterfinals for the first time in seven years. The first time since 2014. Huge performance. They blank Atletico. So the final eight are set, and we will absolutely talk about them tomorrow when I react to my incredible predictions. I thank you guys for watching once again. Thank you to everyone who came out to all the live streams. That was a ton of fun. My name is Adrian, and I'll see you tomorrow. Peace. Peace.